This is the lecture for part one, uh, chapter one. So private right concerning what is externally mine or yours in general. And then in that part, chapter one, how to have something external as one's own. So you'll notice when you read through this section, how to have something external as one's own, we're talking about sort of uh, property. Kant's very interested in possession and how to sort of uh, come to possess the external world or parts of the external world, how something can be rightfully yours or rightfully mine. And uh, these are interesting topics on their own. One of the reasons he's so focused on this is because a lot of philosophers have taken sort of possession and ownership to be very related to lots of other political topics, namely uh, why the state has certain rights to pass certain laws and why you must obey the laws and things like that. And specifically, the main philosopher to have in mind here is Locke, who I don't think Kant talks about uh, by name in this section, but he's the sort of big person along with Hobbes who uh, were, it's going to be useful to think about in comparison to Kant. And so in this lecture, we're going to talk about Locke and specifically Locke's ideas of possession, private property, and ownership, and how they relate to politics. And you can compare those to what Kant is saying both in this chapter and then throughout the rest of the book. So for Locke, like Hobbes and like Kant, we sort of think about things in terms of a state of nature where there is no state. Uh, nobody owns anything. Uh, no state exists. Uh, no government exists, anything like this. Locke thinks that in the state of nature, you can go around appropriating things or possessing things. Uh, how do you have something external as one's own, according to Locke? What you do is you mix your labor with it, basically. So you can go around and uh, come to own something by laboring on it. You own your body, and so you own your labor, and so when you own, when you put the labor that you own into something, it becomes yours. So say that you take a section of land and you clear it off and you plant a bunch of crops and then you harvest the crops. Because all of that is your labor, because you put all that work into the land and into the crops, you now own that land and those crops. That's how you come to have something external as your own, according to Locke. You mix your labor with it. Now you can't just do it for absolutely anything. Number one, it has to be unowned. So I can't mix my labor with your stuff because you already own that stuff. So it has to be unowned stuff just sitting out there, unappropriated land or unappropriated property. If I pick up an apple that uh, nobody grew, it belongs to me. But if I pick up an apple that you put your labor in, that you grew that apple, it still belongs to you. So first, it can't be somebody else's property. You can only possess unowned things. Second, Locke thinks you can't just go around possessing whatever you want. You have to uh, leave enough and as good for others. And specifically what that means is you have to leave people enough stuff, so you can't just take everything. And you can't just leave them anything. You have to leave them stuff that's just as good as whatever you're taking. So I can't take all the good land on which you can grow crops and leave you all the rocky land which you can't grow crops on. I can never take something if I don't leave enough uh, and as good for you. So I have to leave stuff for you, which is just as good as whatever I'm taking. And I can't take so much that it's like more than I can use. So this is called the anti-spoilage rule. So I can't say, uh, you know, all of this, you know, 100 acres of land belongs to me, even though I can only till and plant crops in one acre uh, before I get tired. So if I do that, the rest of the land is just sort of spoiling. It's not being used for anything. So Locke says, no, you can only take as much as you can sort of actually labor on and actually make use of. So that's how you come to own something uh, in the state of nature. And for Locke, this is interesting on its own. It's how we come to own things when the government doesn't exist. But it's also interesting because it relates to how the government comes into existence. So how does the government come into existence? Well, think back to Hobbes. Hobbes says, look, the state of nature is just a mess. You, like, who cares how you own anything? Like, somebody's going to steal it from you. Somebody's going to kill you and take your stuff. Uh, there, it's just horrible. So, of course, everybody signs a contract to create the sovereign to protect us immediately. That is Hobbes's picture. Locke's picture is different. Locke says, look, the state of nature is 
fine, you know, people can go around growing crops and living on their own or whatever, but it is kind of inconvenient. So when there's going to be property disputes or things like this, uh, there's going to be disagreement, like people are going to disagree about what belongs to everybody, and it's going to be kind of annoying to resolve them, because without an impartial judge, people are going to be biased in their own favor, they're going to make mistakes, stuff like this. And so it's just, it's just much easier if we set up a government to sort of manage property disputes and make sure you don't steal from me and I don't steal from you and stuff like that. And so Locke thinks what you do is you take your property and you sort of agree along with a bunch of other people who have property to sort of join together and form a state. And you sign a contract with the state, which says it's going to protect your property and pass laws and stuff. And if the state transgresses this law or this contract, you know, you sign a contract that says the state will protect your property and stuff, and it doesn't do this, it starts to steal your property or it doesn't protect you from bandits, then the contract is sort of null and void. The state is not doing its job and you can withdraw. You can just sort of overthrow the state and set up a new state, or you can just leave. You can say, you know, I'm not going to be in this state anymore. I'm taking my farm and leaving. So unlike Hobbes, who says, look, you're sort of desperate to leave the state of nature, you must give up all your rights to the state, and now the state rules you basically however it wants, Locke says, no, 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 you're not desperate to leave the state of nature, it's just convenient to leave the state of nature. And so you don't give up all your rights to the state, you just sign a contract with the state to have it protect your stuff. And as soon as the state starts screwing that up, you either get rid of the state or you just leave the state. So that's the Lockean picture. We're going to see that Kant has a very different picture of how we come to own something, what sorts of rules apply to owning things, and he's going to have a very different picture of how the state comes into existence or why the state comes into existence. And so now that we have Hobbes and Locke on the table, uh, we can sort of start to draw some comparisons between them and Kant.